So to quickly introduce you to the moderator of our first panel is our very own uh, Professor John Maurer. Um, John has been at the Naval War College for many years. He was, for eight years was the chairman of the strategy department and I can tell you um, there's probably no one more committed to um, the education of the joint force leaders, the future leaders of the joint force, um, through strategy than John. So uh, a little shout out to you for doing an awesome job and over to you. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, introduction. In an age of smartphones, smart cars, smart houses, of course we need smart people. That's critical. As the CNO talked today, to be able to make informed decisions, you have to have habits of thought, disciplined habits of thought, to help guide decision makers. And so today, I want to quote from Proverbs, plans succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. Well, today we have good counsel and wise advice up here on the stage. What a distinguished panel we have here today for the first panel of the current strategy forum. While the amount of intellectual firepower here uh, is something that has probably never been equaled since Mahan's time. <laughs> Well, without further ado, what I want to do is introduce our first speaker, Dr. Graham Allison, who is the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at Harvard, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, founding dean of the modern Kennedy School of Government, author of numerous articles and books on international relations and national security affairs. His book, Essence of Decision on the Cuban Missile Crisis, is a classic, a text that we use Nuclear Terrorism, again, an incredible book about the dangers of nuclear terrorism that we have used as a text here at the college. And he has his just released book, Destined for War, that draws upon Thucydides. As the students here know, Thucydides is a staple of the college strategy courses stretching back to the time of Mahan. There's much ancient wisdom there that can be applied to today, and Dr. Allison has done this in this book, Destined for War. Um, by the way, all of our panelists are distinguished authors, and copies of their books are in our own very fine, nice bookstore here at the college. Uh, Destined for War looks at the looming dangers of conflict between China and the United States. Dr. Allison has also had extensive service in government, including Assistant Secretary of Defense, where he played a leading role, an important role, in reducing the threat uh, posed by the nuclear arsenal of the former Soviet Union. Without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Allison. Thanks very much, John, and it's a great honor for me to be here today. I think when uh, uh, John's introduction about the firepower of the panel, I looked at Paul Kennedy and I think we instantly had the same uh, feeling, a, a recollection of the line about the, you know, never was there such a distinguished assembly uh, uh, since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Uh, <laughs> and I think it, uh, ne never was there so distinguished a panel since Mahan was here by himself. Uh, uh, so I'm a great fan of John's, a great fan of the Naval War College. Uh, actually, uh, when I, Derek Reverend was giving me a ride from Providence Airport this morning, I was remembering that I first came here when uh, Stan Turner was, became the president of the, of the uh, and Stan, I was, had uh, just become, or I was a few years as dean of the Kennedy School, and Stan had some ideas about some reforms that he wanted to make here. I think he wanted some academic cover to basically agree with him. He had the ideas, but we offered a little advice. I've been a big fan of the Naval War College e ever since, so it's a pleasure to be here. So as John mentioned, I have a new book just published. It was May 30th. It's called Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides Trap? Now, for most audiences, uh, especially Americans, uh, first, Thucydides is multisyllabic. 
uh, and that's challenging, okay? Uh, and, and secondly, he's a mouthful. There's no doubt about that. So uh, the number of people who managed to mush the name uh, is quite a lot, but I'm hoping that before uh, this effort is done, among other things that the book may help do, is to remind people that if Thucydides is not part of your mental canon, you're deficient. And I know that John has taught the Thucydides here for many years. Uh, I tell audiences as I've been doing this rollout that basically uh, the bargain of, you know, of your summer would be go to the net, download for free the Peloponnesian War, just read book one, the first hundred pages, and if it doesn't knock your socks off, check your pulse, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, this, this book has one big idea and one big takeaway, and let me mention those. The big idea is Thucydides' trap. When a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, alarm bells should sound, extreme danger ahead. Thucydides taught us about this in the case of Athens and Sparta, and it's a storyline as old as history itself, and it's been repeated regularly thereafter. So that's the big idea. And the big takeaway, uh, I would put it just uh, to avoid unnecessary wars. And I'll say more about that before I'm done. But it turns out uh, that on my list of unnecessary wars uh, in American history, uh, I put not only Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam, but also World War I and even more provocatively, World War II. But I think John will tell us about that from the book that he's doing uh, later. So let me start with three big questions, three tweets, and then I'll say a word about each. Okay? So the three big questions. What is the geopolitical event of our lives, professionally, let's say the last generation? And secondly, looking forward, what is the central, uh, the cardinal, geostrategic challenge for the United States today and for far as, the, as far as the eye can see? And thirdly, the subtitle of the book, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? Uh, so uh, in the, uh, uh, try, trying to be consistent with the new style, uh, a tweet version answer for each. Okay? So, uh, and then I'll do a little, ex uh, a little explanation. Uh, first, what is the geopolitical event of the past generation? And my candidate is the rise of China. Uh, never before has a nation risen so far, so fast on so many different dimensions. And particularly for people who are not China watchers, and who haven't been paying that much attention to this space, and that includes me, I'm not a China scholar, I don't read Mandarin. Only the last decade I've been trying to learn about China. But uh, uh, China has emerged so far, so fast, in so many different domains, that I quote in the book, uh, former Czech President Václav Havel, we haven't yet had time yet to be astonished. So secondly, what's the geostrategic challenge looking ahead today and for as far as we can see? And my answer to that is that it's the impact of China's rise on the U.S. and on the global order that the U.S. constructed in the aftermath of World War II and has maintained in the, in the decades since. The international order that accounts for what Paul's uh, colleague, John Gaddis, is called rightly the long peace, seven decades without great power war, which is a historically anomalous phenomenon. So what's the great geostrategic challenge? The impact of the rise of China on the US and the global order. Third, can America and China escape through Thucydides' trap? So there I'd be more professorial and say no, and yes, okay, again, briefly. So no, uh, business as usual, I argue in the book, will likely produce history as usual. 
And in the book, I look at the last 500 years and find repeatedly, business as usual, producing wars. So no, not escape, if we cannot do better than business as usual. On the other hand, yes, we can escape Thucydides' trap uh, if we can imagine uh, learning the lessons of history, as the Santayana line goes, only those who fail to study history are condemned to repeat it. So if, God forbid, we find ourselves in a war with China this year or next year or in the next decade, I don't believe the leaders will be able to excuse themselves by claiming that they were victims of some iron law of history. It'll be because of mistakes that they made, not unlike mistakes that were made in earlier cases that led to outcomes that they didn't want. So that's my three questions. There's the three tweets. Uh, I've got about 10 more minutes, and I'm going to take you at a rapid pace through the three points again. So first, the rise of China. Uh, I actually have a slide which I don't know if it arrived. If it didn't, I don't need it. If it did, it's fun. So I will tell you about it, since I think I can relate to it, since I came from the Providence Airport this morning and discovered the joys of the bridge that you all are reconstructing. Uh, so those of you who've been to Harvard lately will note that there's a famous bridge across the river, Charles, between the business school and the Kennedy School. It's called the Anderson Bridge. The, re the rehabilitation of this bridge was first discussed when I was dean, and I quit being dean at the Kennedy School in 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, the construction project began in 2012. It's a two-year project. Uh, uh, at the end of the two years, it was extended for a year. Then it was extended for another year. Now they've given up uh, proposing a date when it's going to be finished. So it's just, if you look at the website, it says question mark. And it's three times over budget, yeah? Uh, so there's also, I'm going to be in Beijing next week, and there's a bridge that I've been across. It's called the Senyan Bridge. Uh, it's three times bigger than the Anderson Bridge. It's in Beijing, down in Central, across the river. Uh, in 2014, the Chinese decided they need to rehabilitate this bridge, and they began the project. Uh, how long did it take to complete this project? Somebody want to make a guess? How long? 43 hours. <laughs> 43 hours. You go to Google or YouTube, so you go to YouTube, put in the Chinese Sunyan Bridge, or just put in Chinese Bridge 43 hours, and you'll see the timeline of this thing. I mean, that's the slide that I would have showed you, okay? Now, if they were proposed to come and fix the Anderson Bridge now at Harvard, I would also pay, because rather than sit in the traffic jam, to have this done the American way, okay? So, in the course, I offer uh, students in my course at Harvard, which a couple of people here actually have been, you know, are graduates of, uh, a, uh, a set of 26 indicators with the question, when could China become number one? So automobile manufacturer, smartphone manufacturer, robot manufacturer, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, supercomputers, fastest supercomputers, number of billionaires, uh, largest economy in the world. So when, and they have to take a quiz, in effect, write down when. So they say 2030, 2050, not in my lifetime. Then I have a second slide, and the, t the title of it is Already. Okay. So in every one of these 26 indicators, China has already overtaken the US. So I'll do it again. Number of billionaires, number of robots manufactured and bought and used, the fastest supercomputers, they were not even in the game five years ago. They won the first four places last year. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, most Americans don't get it, and, and most of the news sources would not tell you. But the big headline from the IMF World Bank meeting in 2014 is China is now the largest economy in the world, measured by what the IMF and the CAA believe is the best yardstick for measuring and comparing national economies, namely purchasing power parity. 
So if you go to the CAA website, if you go to the IMF website, you'll see that the Chinese economy is about 10% bigger than the US today. Today. So in every domain, we see a rising China in the Chinese narrative and with some considerable merit, the restoration of China, as they think of it, to the position that it ex enjoyed before the West intervened. But if you haven't seen China in your face yet or in your space yet, I would say you haven't been looking carefully or, or if necessary, just wait. So that's the rise of China. Second question, the geostrategic challenge looking forward. Uh, this is the impact of the rise of China on the US, US sense of ourselves, the US sense of our role in the world, and the international order that the US has been the principal architect and maintainer of. Uh, I testified to the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, three years ago about this, and the, the ranking Democrat on the committee from here in Rhode Island, Jack Reed, is a former student of mine, a very good guy. And Jack invited me and he said, uh, you know, Graham, you should make this simple. Uh, so I said, okay, I will work hard on this. So I gave him 10 pages that I thought was quite clear and simple. And he sent it back and he said, I, I told you simple. You know, so I, 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 I sent it back and it was five pages. And he said, no, 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 simple. So I made a cartoon, okay? Uh, and I produced the cartoon in the book. Uh, uh, so this cartoon imagines a seesaw. So you know, remember the seesaw from the, from the playground. So a seesaw, you have the US sitting on one end of the seesaw and China sitting on the other end. Now as of 1980, China's GDP was less than 10% of the US. So the weight of these two uh, uh, guys on the seesaw is the relative size of their economies. So by 2014, China is equal to the US, slightly larger. So the seesaw has moved like this. And by 2024, on the current trend lines, China will be half again larger. So the seesaw will look like this. So I said to uh, the Armed Services Committee, you know, we're debating here in the Obama administration, it's a big initiative in Asia, it's called a pivot. And what was the pivot about? So the pivot was about whether this guy on the seesaw was going to put more weight on his left foot in the Middle East where we're fighting wars, or we should lighten up there a little bit to put more weight on our right foot in Asia where the future is going to be. But what's, what was failed to note was that all the while our feet are just lifting off the ground. So this is going to be a rather irrelevant discussion. So basically the idea that the tectonics have shifted to the point that you have a China which is a larger economy than the US is, I don't like it, it's incredible. Now, for Americans, especially red-blooded Americans, even worse, red-necked red-blooded Americans like me, I come from North Carolina, I know that somewhere it is written and I'm searching for it. So maybe he, Paul is a great historian, he may be able to help me find it. It's either in the Bible or maybe in the Constitution or, or Shakespeare somewhere, but it says USA means number one. Okay? <laughs> okay. So, and I think actually if you take off your shirt, if you're a redneck American, and you rub, uh, rub off the, the uh, cosmetics, you'll see there's a tattoo that says uh, USA means number one. That's who we are, that's our DNA. So the idea that there's another country as big and strong as we are, that's not acceptable. I mean, it's not acceptable. I would prefer not to have such a world. I think a world in which the US is the biggest and strongest country is a better world. But in any case, as Lee Kuan Yew says, and I quote him here in the book, this is the biggest player in the history of the world, and Americans are gonna have to find a way to adjust to this reality. Now, what is the impact then of this tectonic shift? Uh, so we have a rising power threatening to displace a ruling power. This is Thucydides' big idea. You'll remember that he explained about the Peloponnesian War. He says lots of other people pointed to other, other factors, but I'm gonna go to the heart of the matter. It was the rise of China, sorry, the rise of Athens, and the fear 
that this instilled in Sparta that made the war inevitable. I look at, in this book at the last 500 years, actually and one of my one best sources for, and guides for this was Paul Kennedy and his great book on the rise and fall. And Paul was a great tutor for me in all of this exercise. So although I, I, he's not to blame for any of the mistakes of which there are many, okay. uh, the last 500 years, 16 cases of rising power threatening to displace the ruling power, 12 of the cases in, in war, four of the cases in not war. So inevitable is exaggeration, that's hyperbole, but business as usual likely produce history as usual. Uh, in this case, as we see the impact of the rise of China on the U.S., we also see this on all the rest of the international order and the structures. And nowhere is this more evident than in Asia. So I would say watch for all of the Asian relationships to be stressed. And if you haven't seen this stress yet, again, you haven't been looking. In the Philippines, in Thailand, in South Korea, which is going to be a very stressful relationship in the year ahead, I believe, even in Australia. Uh, because if you're my number one economic partner, you're my market, you're a source of investments, you're going to have a lot of influence on me, especially if you play the game as China does, which is tough. So that's the second point. Third point, just very briefly, uh, can America and China escape Thucydides trap? And I would say, if we do know better than the statesman who uh, dealt with the situation in 1914. I have a good chapter in the book on the road to 1914. Uh, the answer is no. So how in the world did the assassination of an archduke in Sarajevo by a Serbian terrorist end up serving as a spark that produced the fire that burned down the whole house of Europe? I mean, it's an incredible story. When I, when I read it now, and look at it, and I've been looking at it for you know, 50 years, it's still more incredible to me today than that events on the North Korean Peninsula in a year or two ahead could lead us to a war with China. So in the, at the end of the war, every one of the leaders, every one of the participants had lost what he cared about most. So the Austro-Hungarian emperor, his empire's gone, he's out. The Russian Tsar is backing the Serbs. He'd been overthrown by the Bolsheviks, his whole regime. Kaiser backing his buddy in Vienna. He's out. France has been bled of its youth for a whole generation, never recovers as a society. And Britain, which had been a great creditor country, is turning, turned into a debtor and is on a slide to decline. So at the end of this war, if you'd given people a chance for a do-over, nobody would have chosen what he did, but they did, and, and, and it happened. So that's the no. On the yes side, uh, if you look at the Cold War, I have, a, again, a chapter in the book that's one, of the, that's one of the no war cases. Cold War is an unbelievable, unbelievable, uh, the strategy that was invented. And just to go back and to remember, in 1946, so we're one year after the war, George Kennan, the number two diplomat in the um, Soviet Union, writes back this famous document that historians know as the long telegram. So what does it say? It says, we've just finished World War II, we've just defeated the Nazis, but the Soviet Union, with communism on the march, is posing to the US a greater danger, a more ominous threat to our vital interests than did Nazism. That was not a message that anybody wanted to hear in, in Washington in 1946. We were exhausted bringing the troops home and whatever. That stimulated a conversation and debate among people whom we now revere as the wise men. So Atchison, Truman, uh, Vandenberg, Nitze, uh, out of which emerged a remarkable strategy, all dimensional, fantastically uh, imaginative, fantastically demanding for war in every dimension and by all forms except bombs and bullets killing each other. And that strategy was then pursued by Republicans and Democrats for four decades to success. So I would say to conclude that what I would hope might emerge from this 
would be a recognition that the current condition with the rise of China threatening the displacement of the ruling US produces severe structural stress in which external events like the assassination of an archduke or the launch of or, or the exercise or the testing of missiles on the Korean Peninsula could create, can create cascades of actions and reactions that lead to where you don't want to go. Now that's on the one hand. But that on the other hand, that if we could imagine strategy as bold as what was developed for the Cold War strategy, uh, Thucydides' trap can be escaped. Thank you, Graham, for that. Uh, our next, next speaker is uh, Professor Paul Kennedy, who is the J. Richardson uh, Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University. He is Director of Yale's International Security Studies. He is a distinguished fellow of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy, which is one of the leading programs, courses, highly regarded Grand Strategy course in the world. He is the author of numerous articles and books, uh, Graham talked about the outbreak of the First World War. Paul's book, The Rise of the Anglo-German Antagonism, is a must-read book on the origins of the First World War. His book, <coughs> Engineers of Victory, provides a fascinating account of the role played by mid-level problem solvers in producing Allied victory in the Second World War. His books, The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery and The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, these books are classics and are read here as texts at the uh, college in our strategy courses. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you for being our panel leader. Uh, Admiral Harley, Admiral Richardson, ladies, gentlemen, uh, I'm really happy to be with you today uh, on this panel, this panel, which connects history and enduring strategic principles, is the word, and present-day challenges in this matter of national security and fleet design. And I'm going to take the latter topic very seriously in my 20 minutes of remarks. The, the latter topic, fleet design, seems to me, is and always has been a critical one for navies and for the countries which depend upon their navies. And I don't think it's an exaggeration for, for me to say that for every hundred pundits or authors on national security and foreign affairs, <coughs> there would be only one, if that, who paid any attention to the design of fleets, to the structure of naval forces, to the aptitude of warships in changing strategic environments, to the right types of warships. There are scholars who do look at warship design. There are scholars that do look at the structure of navies. They don't often deal with large-scale strategic environment. And the large-scale strategic environment people couldn't tell a frigate from <laughs> a bumbo, <coughs> really. I also confess a deep personal pleasure at being back here again. The first time I came here was to be interrogated about Tirpitz and the German Navy and what it meant with Admiral Gorchow and the Soviet Navy in the 1980s. I'm really pleased for two personal reasons. First, I am grappling with a new book called Victory at Sea, 1936 to 1946, which looks at the relationship between American productive and technological power that emerges in the middle of the Second World War by about 1943 or so, and the newer warships and weaponry, the newer fleet design that arrives on the battlefronts to win both the Atlantic and the Pacific campaigns. And secondly, uh, at my little shop, uh, International Security Studies at Yale, we started a, a smallish, very small, Maritime and Naval History Project. And one of its aims surely has to be to relate historical evidence to our contemporary strategic situation. It seems to me, I put this in uh, parentheses in case I'm going to be kicked under the table and I will say I didn't mean it really. It seems to me 
tragic that none of the Ivy League universities or the major research universities <coughs> yet are doing anything in the realm of maritime and naval studies and maritime and naval history. The, the emails I sent around asking my colleagues and friends at different departments in the, in the prestigious universities of the country, well, who is your naval historian? Who, what, where, what international naval comparative courses do you offer was met with Admiral Richardson, it was met with puzzlement. Like, what do you mean, who is our naval historian? I thought, well, this is the number one <coughs> naval power in the world. 90% uh, approximately of all of our traded commodities are carried by sea. Uh, and who is our naval historian? So I'm really happy to be pushing this at Yale. I'm happy to be interacting with you here. It's not difficult, really, if you think about it, to use history critically. We could begin with uh, anniversaries. It's exactly 100 years ago this summer in 1917 that the British Admiral Jellicoe, the CNO, if you like, by then, confesses his fears that the Allies would lose the war because they don't know how to handle the German U-boat offensive in the Atlantic. The British had won the surface war Jutland and a vast fleet of British and now American battleships lay ready for action, anchored in Scarpa flow, but they didn't have the correct fleet design to handle submarines. It seems to me a great irony that by the middle and late 1917, proud flotillas of very fast, expensive fleet destroyers were being taken from the Grand Fleet to join in with the sloops and corvettes and frigates to join in Atlantic anti-submarine work. That wasn't what they were designed for, but now they have to do it. The second lesser known anniversary is that it's exactly 74 years ago in June 1943 that the first of the new Essex-class fleet carriers steams into Pearl Harbor to begin the carrier-led offensive across the Central Pacific that even non-historians know a bit about, and Professor Simmons writes quite a lot about. The Gilbert Islands taken, then the Marshalls, then the ill-designed or ill-structured Japanese fleet hammered again and again then the Philippines operation, then Iwo Jima, Okinawa, all under the umbrella of carrier-based air power. With the old fleet design of battleship-centric naval force pushed back to a supporting role as coastal bombardment forces. Like all other armed services, navies find it hard to rethink their existing strengths, even in a fast-changing strategic environment. Because, well, obviously, you possess an existing strength. You find it hard to make the change. Consider one of the greatest ironic examples of a warship fleet design as we see it in retrospect. We're all wise in retrospect. I know a historian's job is to be wise in retrospect. <laughs> But consider the fleet design that half got it right and half got it wrong. Namely, the coming of Jackie Fisher's Dreadnought-class battleship launched in February 1906. That design got it right because it stymied and boxed in to Pitts's naval strategy. Whatever newer battleships and larger battleships the Germans could build, the British could build more and simply lock the high seas fleet into the North Sea. But the super battleship of the time, that super battleship type, comes to fruition, ironically, just when the most astounding newer technologies are emerging, all of which were to make surface warships, however big, so vulnerable. First, a torpedo. A torpedo, the greatest ship sinking projectile of the coming two world wars. 
Secondly, the <coughs> submarine. In 1906, just when this dreadnought is being launched, the submarine is only eight years away from that small German U-boat sinking three British heavy cruisers off Heligoland at the very beginning of World War I. It was more casualties than Jutland, by the way. And third, the aircraft, whose destructive potential against traditional armies and navies, only the futurists like H.G. Wells and Leo Amory then fully grasped. I'm struck time and time again by the wisdom of a remark by the lovely, much long time deceased British historian, Gerald Graham, where he talks about the historical irony of a super battleship dreadnought just being conceived at the time when in the background there were coming along the newer technologies which were going to undermine it. A, a fleet design which half gets it right and half gets it wrong. I, I like that idea, ladies and gentlemen. I like it a lot. I, I know it would take a full lecture to tease it out, and it can't be done here. And I know my few remaining remarks about national security and design are about things and ideas that certainly some of the Navy planners are chewing over. But, but for the nonce, uh, here goes in, in my remaining few minutes. If you put it in grand strategical terms, truly grand strategical terms of the largest possible way of thinking, the three great tasks, the three great aims for the US Navy and the other services remain the following. First, the defense of the homeland and the sea lane communications to the homeland. I just can't see that core strategic aim being under any real, real threat. We are not Great Britain in 1940 or the young America of 1812. So I leave it aside, but with the recognition that is the fundamental one. Secondly, the defense of NATO Europe and the Atlantic waters. I can't do justice to my arguments here, but I believe that that purpose is still eminently achievable despite our reduced resources that Secretary Lehman was talking about. Putin's Russia is dangerous again, but it remains to a large degree a preposterously modern equivalent of Potemkin's village. And I'm happy to discuss that if you want in a Q&A. Thirdly, and much more seriously, this is where I come along with Graham, much more seriously because we haven't figured it out even some 40 years after we left Vietnam. Thirdly, we struggle with the challenge of how on earth we offshore islanders can influence the future of Asia. An Asia which begins, remember, on the Lebanese shores and ends in the waters of Japan and the Philippines. I think I'm gonna repeat that half sentence. We struggle with the challenge of how on earth we offshore islanders can influence the future of Asia. Eisenhower and before him Lord Salisbury were right. The sea nations cannot and should not seek to place a large footprint on Asian soil again. It cannot work. It's too big. Asia has too much land. Mountains, deserts, gullies, jungles. And there's just too many people there. Perhaps five billion people between Beirut and Jakarta who'll have to figure out their own destinies. Don't ever go there again, or not without a large Asian ally like India to do most of the land fighting. There's ways of having a significant marginal influence, of course, not only by making a huge and clever investment in the tool of diplomacy, and I have to say how awful it is to see diplomacy traduced by our current dysfunctional national leadership, which is not filling places, is paying no regard to the lack of ambassadors and 
anyone else we have, but also by, and I return to the theme of, I think it's Admiral Richardson's selected topic of this forum, by intelligent consideration of the design of fleets, navies, warship types, maritime force. So I end my brief remarks here by returning to what one might call the 1906 question. That example of a dreadnought strategic design getting it half right and yet missing a lot and thus getting it half wrong. So I close my contribution more with questions and half spun ideas than with answers. So here then, Admiral, are four simple questions from a simple naval historian. A, have we still not yet got a full appreciation of the power of submarines as a devastator of any and all surface vessels, as the underground conveyor of a whole range of missiles and drones, and of course, as the destroyer of enemy submarines? I think we are still missing their terrible full implication. And before the submarine crowd <coughs> here gives a big cheer, I have, a, I have a related question. Do we still have no place in this Navy for a sizable fleet of less expensive, non-nuclear, diesel-powered, super-quiet subs? I'm reminded that, after all, as I study now the Second World War in a great deal of detail, I'm reminded that all German U-boat commanders thought that the smaller Type 7 U-boats were the best. Not the bigger, roomier, clattier, clutchier ones, but the smaller ones were the best. Second, are we right to have a fleet design policy that places so much, so very much of the Navy's money, men, aircraft, and thinking into a mere nine or 10 or 11 super large hulls? That is our giant aircraft carriers. You can argue, of course, that you need a number of very big vessels for very big wars. I don't contest that. But as I read more about them, I'm getting increasingly impressed by the role and the effectiveness of the US Navy's light fleet carriers throughout the Pacific War after 1943, doing everything that the fleet carriers did, only, of course, they're smaller but at far less cost. So why today do we not like them? Third, why are we, and along with us, the Koreans, the Japanese, why are we designing destroyer types that are ever larger, ever more expensive, with a displacement tonnage the size, beyond the size of the heaviest cruisers of World War II? What am I missing here? Would the Navy not benefit if at least to some degree, to some degree, its destroyer budget partly went to an array of very sophisticated vessels, say circa 4,000 ton, multi-purpose sloops, able to defend themselves in a modern electronic environment, but also to handle everything from piracy to disaster relief. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a 2025 world of huge environmental and demographic stresses, with much of Africa and the Middle East in truly enormous political and refugee chaos, the sort of things the World Bank and the World Pop Population Fund are just scared stiff of. Imagine that. What do 10,000 ton destroyers do when we ask the Navy to go in and help? A final agnostic question. Have we got the issue of manned as opposed to unmanned air power right for the world of 2025 or 2040? Will it not seem weird to later historians that we, us here, lived in a decade when unmanned motor vehicles were perfected on land <laughs> while we kept our preference for hugely expensive manned aircraft going and going and going until, of course, 
They were all shot down in an area world of amazing missiles and rocketry. Do we still have too much of a dreadnought complex here? So I know this presentation ends with questions, not answers. Hopefully tomorrow morning's panel will help out in, in that regard. Some of the greatest seminal small essays on strategic matters have ended with questions rather than answers. This certainly isn't one of them, but I do think we don't do enough asking the historians questions about our larger strategic posture and by implication, of course, about our armed forces and then, of course, about our fleet design. <coughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Our third panelist is Craig Simons. He is Professor Emeritus from the U.S. Naval Academy. I know there are many officers here, Navy, Navy Marine officers who are in, in the audience here who were students of, of, of Craig. I'm sure some of them have come up to you, right, Craig, and said hello and asked why they got that grade that they got. Uh, he has also served as a military professor here at the Naval War College. He is the author of prize-winning books, Decision at Sea, Lincoln and His Admirals, The Battle of Midway, The Civil War at Sea, Neptune, wonderful study about uh, uh, the D-Day invasion. I am pleased to say that he will be returning to the Naval War College this coming academic year to serve as the Ernest J. King Professor of Maritime History. Uh, Craig, over to you. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, Tom and I, just before we sat down up here, were looking at the batting order and deciding that we had a distinct advantage because we got to go after our esteemed colleagues here. So I'm going to make my remark. What he said, that's <laughs> exactly right. Good morning. But let me see if I can uh, elaborate just a little bit on that. Uh, by the way, my first lecture opportunity here at the Naval War College was in 1972. Graham, I think I have you beat by a month or two. Uh, when I lectured, I believe the first and perhaps still the only ensign ever to lecture uh, to the College of Naval Warfare at the Naval War College. It's been 45 years since then. I'm delighted to be coming back this fall to see how you've, uh, the stewardship of the program has survived. Um, going third also gives me the advantage to comment on uh, some things my uh, predecessors had to say here. I, I was interested in Graham's comment about unnecessary wars. Both Paul and I have been working assiduously on one of those, the Second World War. Um, I have always believed that of all the wars in which the United States has participated, two of them, were not only necessary but essential. And that those two were the two I've spent most of my life studying, the American Civil War and the Second World War. The reasons being that I cannot imagine in my historical imagination any circumstance that would have allowed our society to eliminate slavery with its enormous financial investment in chattel slavery, absent a violent confrontation, and I cannot imagine suppressing Hitler and Nazism without a violent confrontation. So those two things, I think, have been necessary. I mentioned that I've been working on a World War II book. I just finished literally weeks before we came up here yesterday uh, to participate in this panel. Um, and it opened my eyes to a number of, of ideas, many of which Paul touched upon, which I think is Wonderful, and, and one in particular that I wanted to talk about because much time was spent this morning talking about ship numbers. Um, numbers are not my thing. I'm an historian. Nevertheless, uh, and, and, and Paul, I think, made uh, a very thoughtful uh, comment on this, that assessing numbers alone can't give us a sense of capability. The lieutenant who asked the question about how do you balance capability versus numbers, I think, is critical to us. In 1945, when the Second World War came to an end, the United States Navy was the most powerful sea force in the history of the world. It would 
more powerful by multiple numbers over all the other naval forces on the planet combined. Some 65,000 combatants if you count armed landing ships. Today, there are, depending on how you count, 275, 287, 282. But I'm here to suggest to you, if you have an opportunity to place a bet on a confrontation between those 65,000 in 1945 and the 275 that exist today, bet everything on today's Navy. Because numbers alone cannot tell us exactly what a Navy can do. And, and that goes back to the idea of saying that the Gerald R. Ford is one unit and a landing craft infantry with a 20 millimeter gun mount in the bow is one unit. And obviously that's absurd. So the question is how can we get maximum capability, maximum influence out of whatever number of platforms we have available on the sea? Another way to look at this is dollars invested. Uh, if you take one of those online programs that allows you to compare 1945 dollars with 2017 dollars and figure the cost of a, a, a destroyer or a destroyer escort or for that matter an aircraft carrier in the Second World War compared with the cost in steady state dollars of similar platforms today, you'll see that for the price of one of these oversized destroyers, 8,000 tons, whatever the displacement may be, uh, you could perhaps get 100 uh, World War II era destroyer escorts and destroyer platforms. So again, dollars also, ship numbers, dollars, those numbers uh, are not all we need to look at. We need to look at capability. We need to look at, uh, at what they're designed to do. And in that respect, the, the tipping points that Paul referred to in terms of the shift from dreadnought battleships into a carrier-oriented warfare in the Pacific, illustrated perhaps best by the Japanese decision just before the outbreak of war in the Pacific in the late 1930s to say, oh, the way we can clearly overmatch the threat that they perceived from across the Pacific from the United States was to build oversized, supersized battleships, the Yamato and the Musashi, displacing, when fully loaded, some 73,000 tons, carrying guns that fired shells of 18.1 inches in diameter at a range of up to 30, 32 miles. That will be the edge that will allow us to overcome this threat that we perceive across the Pacific. But of course, months after the Battle of Midway, weeks after the Battle of Midway, the third of those super battleships was converted into a super aircraft carrier in belated recognition that in fact the index of naval power had shifted and it shifted just at the moment when they were about to apply it just as in 1906 the emergence of the dreadnought shifted just at the moment when the submarine and the aircraft were making surface battleships more vulnerable. Uh, and we need to ask, are we in the midst of one of those shifts right now? Uh, we heard the talk about the OODA loop and how uh, assessment, sensors, and the application of firepower at the beginning and the end of that loop don't necessarily have to come from the largest platforms. And again, in this respect, I would urge consideration of Paul's third question about uh, the continued investment of putting so many eggs into so few baskets into whether or not that is, makes a maximum uh, efficiency of our investment and for that matter of the numbers. The difficulty here is it's harder to convince the public. One of the questions from the audience today, how do you, how do you convey the sense of urgency, the very real sense of urgency about where we are in our naval capabilities vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world to a public when it's easier to say, well, we only have 275 ships and we need to have 350. This is an urgency we must sustain. That's fairly easy to do. It's much harder to say, well, we could do it with 300 ships if they had increased efficiency and capability. Harder to count. Well, the, yes, but there are devices on those ships you see that make them better. It's harder to sell to the public. 
But I, I, I will comment, uh, and I'll wrap up with this, so that is that I think we need to take confidence from the resiliency of American society. Um, in the American Civil War, when Fort Sumter was fired on in Charleston Harbor, the United States had, the United States Navy, had a handful of warships. Uh, when President Lincoln asked Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, how many vessels do we have that in fact are capable now of fighting this war, he said perhaps 12. If you add the ships overseas that could be recalled from the Mediterranean and the Far China Station, maybe we could put together as much as 40. Within a year, there were 200. And by the end of the war, there were 671. Now, I will grant you that the number of those were ersatz modifications, a merchant ship that had been modified to carry some heavy guns. And that's not the kind of thing you can do today, obviously. But I think it speaks to the resiliency of a society that once energized, once informed, once involved, uh, can, in fact, respond to uh, crises in the world. And the same thing is true in the Second World War. When France capitulated in June of 1940, within days, the Congress passed the Two Ocean Navy Act, the great expansion that created 257 new warships, including 18 aircraft carriers in a single appropriation that passed Congress 316 to zero. Now, you couldn't get a bill for Mother's Day to pass <laughs> unanimously today. Uh, those ships, authorized in 1940, were on duty with the arrival of the Essex and Pearl Harbor in June of 1943. So it can be done uh, if we're energized, if we pay attention, and we're serious about what we need to do. Is it still possible today? I I believe that it is, and I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, our last panelist is Thomas Mencken. Uh, Dr. Mencken is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments which is one of the leading centers for the study of maritime strategy and fleet design today. He is also a senior research professor at the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins University's Paul uh, Nitza School of Advanced International Studies. Tom served for over 20 years as an officer in the US Navy Reserve, including tours in Iraq and in Kosovo. His government service includes serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning. He is the author of numerous books and uh, articles, Technology and the American Way of War Since 1945, Uncovering Ways of War, U.S. Intelligence and Foreign Military Innovation, a wonderful study of the interwar period. He has also produced books, Arms Races and International Relations, Strategy in Asia, and also competitive strategies for the 21st century. Tom has done a great deal, in fact, to bring back very much front and center this important concept of competitive strategies that was so important during the closing stages of the Cold War. Tom also served here in the strategy and policy department as a professor for many years. He served as the Captain Jerome Levy Chair of Economic Geography and National Security. Tom, over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you John, um, and CNO, Admiral Harley, and, and John, thank you for, for really leaving uh, the best for last in, in the intro, <laughs> uh, truly, because um, it, it is wonderful to be back. I know it's obligatory to say it's, it's a pleasure to be here, but, but uh, uh, today it actually has the virtue of also being true, so which isn't always true. Um, but you know, my time at, at Newport uh, has been so foundational to, to who I am, uh, the colleagues here, the students, and it's, it really is wonderful, uh, wonderful to be back. Um, in the limited, limited time I have, uh, I want to focus on, on a theme that has already emerged from, from this morning's uh, discussions, and that is the, the reality of great power competition and the increasing possibility of great power war, and how history can help us think about and to at least partially illuminate an uncertain future. Um, 
This is a topic that, that uh, we have been hearing more uh, and more about uh, in, in recent years. And I think great credit goes to, to CNO Richardson for, for emphasizing uh, great power competition, the possibility of great power conflict. Um, and it's a, it's a topic that deserves great discussion and study. Um, because it's, it's one thing to talk, and, and sometimes we talk too euphemistically about these things, uh, but it's one thing to talk about great power competition and conflict. It's another for us to really comprehend the full ramifications of that for the Navy and for our nation. And that's the task that, that lies ahead for us. I think like, um, like, like most of you, like all of us, I really enjoyed Secretary Lehman's uh, talk this morning. But and here I'm, I'm speaking specifically to, to those of you in uniform. My, my guess is that um, it, was, it was interesting, it was uh, compelling in a certain way, but it, it was largely a work of history. And, and a, a work of history that, that perhaps many of us in uniform felt disconnected from. Because this discussion of great power competition and, and conflict uh, is, is, is we're, we're, we're coming back to a topic that we've really not touched on seriously for a quarter century. Now for historians, quarter century is not a long time. For the military, it's a lifetime, or more accurately, it's a professional career. So audience participation time. Those of you in uniform, how many of you were in service, active reserve service, uh, those of you currently in service, were, were in service in 1989. Okay, just, just, as, I, just, just as, I, as I suspected. So a period where great power competition and conflict was dominant is essentially, all due respect, outside the, your professional experience. But it's likely to dominate the rest of your careers and the rest of your lives. So what I'd like to do is, is really, I can't, uh, as, as the other speakers, I can't fully address this, this topic in the limited time I have, but I want to address three dimensions of it and uh, be suggestive rather than definitive. So first, I want to talk about great power competition. Second, I want to talk about deterrence. And then third, war. And all three really are, are linked. Now, Professor Allison has already touched on the topic of great power competition. Um, and I think it's important to look back at history, but it's also, it, in so doing, uh, as much to draw contrasts as comparisons. Um, today, we don't face uh, a replay of, of the Cold War, not capital C, capital W, uh, even if maybe we're, we're in a period of small c, small w, Cold War, um, for a number of reasons. Um, First, we face multiple great power competitors, not just China, uh, but, also, uh, but also Russia. And even if I would I agree, and I do agree, that, that China is the more consequential, consequential challenge, we can't ignore Russia. Second, this multipolar great power competition uh, features actors on different trajectories. So yes, China's rising. China's likely to rise, although maybe not uh, continue to rise, maybe not as, as quickly as, as recently, could have a catastrophic failure. Russia is declining, but of course, in some ways, Russia has been declining for centuries. I mean, you can go back centuries if, with the predictions of Russia's decline and, and collapse. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's different. And certainly, again, as, as Prof Professor Allison said, the outcome of great power competition is not predetermined. Uh, we can look to history to see some happy outcomes. The, uh, you know, the Anglo-American competition, uh, was resolved, I think, as a as a win-win. As so much as we, we we tend not to talk about it in uh, in polite company, uh, as if it didn't happen. Uh, but you know, I live outside of a city that was burned down by the British in 1812. But uh, but um, but that's one end. The other end, Anglo-German rivalry, which which spawned multiple big wars. And with the Cold War, the US-Soviet competition, being a, a midpoint, it did breed war. It bred wars uh, on the Korean Peninsula, Southeast Asia, 
Americans and Soviets did face each other in, uh, we now know, uh, in, uh, in the airs, the, sc the sky over, uh, over Korea, among other places. But it didn't lead to the big, the big war. Um, so as we look forward, we face the challenge of formulating objectives relative to China, relative to Russia, and then developing a strategy to achieve them, hopefully short of war. Uh, and doing so intelligently, doing so in ways that give us options and hopefully constrain our competitors' options. Doing so intelligently to impose costs upon our competitors while uh, minimizing their ability to impose costs on us. And doing it intelligently to seize the initiative Again, as, as uh, Secretary Lehman, I think, very uh, evocatively uh, uh, pointed out this morning, seize the initiative in key areas of the competition uh, while preventing uh, us uh, from, from being put on our back foot by our competitors' moves. Now, in doing so, we need to begin to think seriously about risk, more seriously than we've done in recent years, because a world dominated by a great power competition is not a, a risk-free world. And if we hope to dissuade and deter, we need to incur risk. And that leads me to my, to my second topic, deterrence. We need to think more seriously about deterrence, both conventional deterrence, but also nuclear deterrence, than we have in recent, uh, in recent years. We have, I think for all intents and purposes, uh, fooled ourselves uh, for a long time that we live in a risk-free world. And the environment has actually allowed us to fool ourselves. We've been able to, uh, to, to do things essentially with, with minimal risk. But that world is, is, is going or has already, has already disappeared. Um, we need to think very seriously about risk within the government, and we need to share that, and we need to have a very frank discussion with the American people about, about risk. Uh, and with that is, uh, is we need to think very seriously and debate very ser seriously our, our model of deterrence. Now our recent model of deterrence has been, I would say, implicit. It's best understood by looking at our pattern of behavior really going from the end of, of the Cold War on. That, that implicit model of deterrence has been that uh, when bad things happen, so when, when uh, Iraq invades Kuwait, uh, when uh, the, uh, the Serbs uh, uh, are uh, committing all sorts of atrocities in Kosovo, all sorts of other things go on. What we would build up, we would assemble a, a, a coalition in, uh, with our allies at the center of that. We would, re and then we, uh, we would respond and we would, reverse, uh, we would reverse aggression. And that worked, has worked fairly well for us. Uh, but it's likely to be of limited utility in the future, particularly against great powers um, as, a, as, a, as a counterfactual. Imagine that, imagine the 1990, 1991 model at work uh, against Russia in Crimea as a counterfactual. Let's assume that the political will was there. Let's assume that the decision was that we were gonna treat Crimea like we treated uh, Kuwait. How would that have worked? Not too well, right? Um, could imagine other, other scenarios uh, as well. So because of the geographic proximity of, uh, of potential contingencies uh, relative to uh, uh, great power competitors, uh, the, the fact that there's likely to be less of a, a power imbalance uh, in the future than there has been in the past, we're gonna need to rethink deterrence. So specifically, I think we're gonna have to move away from this, uh, this, uh, this response uh, model to a deterrence concept based on denial and punishment, denying uh, an aggressor the fruit of his aggression, and then inflicting disproportionate damage, uh, again, as a, as a deterrent. And, we, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a concept of conventional deterrence, but I also uh, believe that we may very well need to lean more heavily on our nuclear deterrent in the future than we have at least in our recent, the recent past. Um, Happy to talk more about that. But that leads me to uh, my third and final topic, which is the need to think seriously about 
great power war. We need to think seriously about great power war, not just because it could break out accidentally, uh, but because if we hope to deter, we need to think through the consequences should deterrence fail, because it sometimes, sometimes does. Um, now, for a, a number of reasons, we're moving from an era of quick, decisive wars to protracted uh, attritional wars. And I think, as, as CNO mentioned uh, this morning, you know, a number, of, a number of trends out there are leading us to a more level, figuratively, uh, battlefield. And so future wars are likely to look considerably different than the recent past. Um, and they may share some features with past great power wars, but they also may diverge from past great power wars uh, in, in, in some significant ways as well. But we do need to be thinking about a number of areas that we've neglected uh, over the past quarter century. Um, and let me just give you, give you three. First, we need to think very seriously about mobilization. How best to tap into our nation's great resources uh, in support of, uh, of war fighting. Now, mobilization in the 21st century is likely to look a lot different than mobilization during World War II. Uh, we're unlikely to uh, plant victory gardens. Uh, don't know if we're going to be uh, uh, collecting scrap metal. Um, I hope my wife's not going to have to paint the back of her legs uh, with, uh, with eyeliner because uh, all the nylons needed for uh, parachutes instead of, uh, instead of pantyhose. Uh, but what, is, what, is, what does mobilization look like in, in the 21st century, in the information age? That's something that we, we need to think very seriously about. Second, we need to think very seriously about logistics um, and uh, logistics for, you know, for, uh, for a big war. Uh, it was not too long ago that you know, two of our best armed, best equipped NATO allies, Britain and France, uh, nearly ran through their entire stock of precision munitions uh, in the uh, air war over Libya. Over Libya. Not Russia, not China, not Iran, not North Korea, but Libya. We need to think very seriously about that. And then finally, we need to think about uh, attrition and reconstitution. I think one of the great stories of, uh, of the US Navy in World War II, and I think underappreciated, is, is our ability not just to build you know, new, uh, new warships and field new warships, but also to fight through damage and, and reconstitute and, and prevail. And in fact, it's one of the, the I think, the, the great stories of the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. It's not the damage that we sustained on December 7th, 1941, but how almost all of the, uh, of the, of the warships were eventually repaired, recovered, and got back into action. We need to get back into, uh, into thinking about those things. So let me leave you with three, uh, three implications as if we are to seriously think about great power competition and the prospect of great power war. Um, the first, with all due respect, we need to stop telling ourselves that we have the greatest armed forces in the world. Because I don't know that we do. I, get, I asked for the show of hands earlier uh, as to uh, you know, who was in, in uh, uniform in 1989. Well, as far as the US Navy is concerned, the last time the Navy fought a serious peer Navy, 1944. Most assuredly outside of the, uh, the, professional, uh, the professional experience of, of those uh, in uniform here. Um, I could say similar things about, about the Air Force. I could say, say similar things about the Marines and the Army. We don't know. We hope, and I think uh, I, um, you know, I would like to give uh, our, our, our sailors the, the A that CNO does, uh, but that, that doesn't add up to being prepared for this, this type of, of conflict. So that's number one. Number two, I think we are, we're entering an era where great power competition and conflict really does need to be the driver not just of our fleet design, but the, the composition of our forces more, more broadly. Uh, even more explicitly, I think we should, uh, we should be looking at competition uh, and the prospect of, of conflict with, 
uh, with great powers as, as, our, as our force sizing construct. And we should then stress test the forces that, that come from that against other types of contingencies. It should be the driver. Third and finally, to bring this back to, to fleet design, where this takes me is, uh, well, in a way, back to the future. Um, it takes me to the need really for a bifurcated fleet, a bifurcated force. Uh, and of course, that's the way historically um, the US Navy, the Royal Navy, uh, was designed. The, the force that was deployed either periodically or, or, or permanently forward for engagement, for deterrence, looked very different than the battle fleet, than the main fleet that would be called upon in time of war. And for a whole bunch of reasons that need not detain us now, uh, we, we got away from that after World War II. We denominated the fleet in kind of like uh, like units, and we use those units as instruments of presence, as, as instruments of deterrence, but also as warfighting uh, instruments. I think we need to go back to, uh, to a, a bifurcated force, uh, a force that includes a deterrent force or deterrence forces, forward stationed with credible combat capability uh, to, uh, to engage, to shape, to deter, to reassure, and then a big, powerful maneuver force uh, designed to fight and win. Uh, that, in, you know, that, uh, that I think will be a big change. Uh, it'll be a big change for us, and it'll also be a big change for our allies and our, our partners and also our competitors who have grown to expect presence, you know, U.S. presence to be denominated in carrier strike groups. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, not something that can be uh, fully addressed in 20 minutes. It's not something that can be fully addressed in, in the two days of the current strategy forum. Um, the, the good news and the challenge for, for those of you in uniform is I think this is going to be the set of issues that you're going to be dealing with as you go forward uh, for the rest of your careers. Thank you very much. We have time before the lunch break to have some questions and comments from uh, the audience. I will recognize them if you raise your hand. We have one right over here. Let's start with that. Dr. Allison, you spoke at length about the containment strategy that was developed um, at the beginning of the Cold War and was quite successful. And you suggested that there ought to be a strategy uh, developed for dealing with uh, the threat from China. I'm sure you've given some thought to what that strategy ought to look like, and I wondered if you'd share that with us. So thank you very much. Uh, oh. Is it good? It's on? Yes. yes. Okay. The, the, uh, 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 I have thought about it, and I tell you the truth. Uh, if I knew the answer, I would uh, have said so. Uh, I say in the conclusion of this book uh, that this book will be very unsatisfactory for Washingtonians, because in Washington, it's necessary to describe the solution to the problem in the same sentence in which you describe the problem. Uh, but the rise of a 5,000-year-old civilization with 1.4 billion people is not a Washington problem to be fixed, in which we just roll out a new strategy, seven to-dos, take an aspirin, and be confident things will get better. I don't think that's correct. I think this is a condition, a chronic condition, that we're going to have to cope with over a generation. But in the conclusion of the book, I sketch a spectrum of strategy. I first say the current strategy of engage but hedge that's been uh, uh, the, the moniker under which we've gone, both under Obama and Bush, basically it permits everything and excludes nothing. So it's been, basically been an excuse for going with the flow, and I think has not served us well. Uh, secondly, I say that uh, uh, the spectrum of strategies that we should be exploring should be way wider than the current conversation. So I give you one well to the left, which is accommodation, uh, in the spectrum just to sort of start the conversation, and one well to the right, which is called undermining and splintering. 
and none of those are part of the current conversation. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I say, I, what I'm hopeful is that as we get our mind around the fact that we're facing a, a, a challenge of Thucydide in proportions, where on the odds, the odds are that it turns out poorly, we'll now stretch our minds and that a lot of people will get involved in the conversation in the same way that happened after 1946. And I think actually, uh, for the, for the uh, people in uniform here, I think it's more likely that some people who are next generation, not old cold warriors like me, will be more imaginative than people that came from my generation. Another question or comment from the audience? Yes, right there. Thank you for all the wisdom on the stage, but I just have one specific question. What do we do about Korea now? Who, who, who wants to take that on? I'll, I'll say a word. Uh, I think the fastest path, I have a chapter in the book called From Here to War, in which all you have to do is put one foot in front of the other to get from where we are now to a war between the US and China with tens of thousands of people killing each other. So I have five of these scenarios. The most plausible is the Korean scenario. In this case, I think we're going to watch it. And it's like a Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion over the months ahead, not years, months. Mm -hmm. Either Kim Jong-un is going to test an ICBM that CAA says will be able to deliver a nuclear warhead against San Francisco or Los Angeles. That's one train coming down the track. Or alternatively, something's going to happen to interrupt that, including a U.S. attack on North Korea to prevent that from happening, which is what President Trump has said he's going to do and is prepared to do. And I think, you know, we're going to have to basically stay tuned. Now, what one would wish in this situation was that this didn't occur in the context of this Thucydide and dynamic. Basically, because we, have a, we see a rising power who's threatening our position, and because they see a ruling power who wants to hold to our current position, this trust level between the two parties is zero. Misunderstandings are magnified in the extreme. So anything any one of the extra takes, takes looks malign or suspicious to the other. And the possibility of the impact of actions by somebody like Kim Jong-un should remind us of this assassination of the Archduke in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. So you would wish that in this case there were adult supervision, but we know we live in Hobbes' world of anarchy. So there's nobody above Xi Jinping and Trump. Uh, if you could imagine a, a, a leaders of the two countries sitting down and say, the idea that a small, impoverished, isolated country should drag the two of us mm -hmm. into a war we don't want is nuts. So we should find a way to deal with this problem. I think if you started there and then you stretch your imagination in which both parties were prepared to start looking at things that they would not now look at in the same way that John Kennedy began to look at options that he would never have conceived before he got to the white of their eyes in the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's some possibilities. Tom, you want to weigh in and then sure. we'll close. Yeah, look, I, I think um, for, for decades, literally for decades, uh, you know, we've fallen prey to uh, wishful thinking when it comes to, to North Korea. Uh, we've, we've, we've tried to wish it away one, one way or the other, either by assuming that the Kim family regime was gonna fall of its own accord, uh, or that, you know, that, that uh, others, the Chinese, would take care of the problem. Uh, and it's been just that. It's been wishful thinking. Um, and it's led us to where we are now. What I would say is, uh, and it really, it, uh, it, it tags on to what I was saying earlier about risk. I mean, we need to think very seriously. Um, how much, you know, uh, of, a, of a threat is a, uh, is a North Korean ICBM, um, because that's, you know, that's sort of the precipitating event. Uh, I, like, I could make the argument, um, because I happen to believe it, actually, that the, the North Korean regime is actually quite rational, quite rational. Uh, and the North Korean regime has successfully played successive American regimes to, to its benefit and has, has, has managed to extend its lifespan because of that. Um, so, you know, can, can we tolerate the, uh, can we tolerate a, a North Korean ICBM? Um, 
well, I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's the discussion worth having. Uh, that's the, definitely the discussion worth having. Join with me in thanking this wonderful panel. Okay, that was by far one of the best panels we've ever had here at CSF. Uh, we have uh, an hour and a half for lunch and see you uh, back in your seats at 1.15. <laughs>